Good morning, Denver. What a great day to be together, to be together on behalf of the causes that we care about and to be together because we love this beautiful country. Don't we live in an amazing country? It's really great. I, I was um, watching a little bit of the live stream yesterday. I was in California. I flew in last night, and I know Donald Trump was speaking. I was like, wow, that's a really huge crowd out there, and it's still huge. So you guys, are, you guys are doing great. And I was also just looking around and hearing the response and even just hearing um, Charlie speaking just now, a lot of the passion in this room and a lot of the youthful and the, the, the vigor, the energy in this room. And truly, this, these aren't, we aren't the leaders of tomorrow. We are the leaders of today. And our country, it's worth clapping over, and our country desperately needs our leadership. Our country desperately needs our voice. Our country desperately needs the truth that we have to share and the love that we have to bring. That's what I want to talk about with you this morning. There's a lot of amazing and important and crucial issues that we're facing today as a country, this election is crucial. I remember four years ago, the election, people were saying this is the most important election in American history, and they're at it again, saying it again. In every election, it seems it becomes more crucial, more important, what happens in 2017, who is going to be in the Oval Office, and who's going to be down ticket, what's the state of our country? And then there's also that deep question of, as politics seem ever more crazy and ever more intense and ever more important, what's happening in our culture? What's happening out there in our communities? What's happening out there in our homes all across America? Where is the heart, the heartbeat of the problem? Where is the source of the problem? This has been an interesting week for the country as well. Some of you, if you were paying attention, I know many of you were because you care passionately about the littlest one, the weakest ones in our country, but on Monday, the Supreme Court decision made a ruling. And this ruling was a huge win for pro-abortion advocates, and that's how it was hailed by many of them. In the Supreme Court decision, 5-3, the court decided that Texas didn't have the right to regulate abortion facilities in their own state. That Texas didn't have the right to demand, for example, that an abortionist had, the, had to have admitting privileges at a local hospital because if he botched an abortion in a facility and the woman needed to go to the emergency room, he couldn't give that continuum of care. And Texas wanted to ensure that those women, that the, the walls of the, the hallways of the abortion facilities would be big enough to fit a gurney through, basic things, basic standards. And yet the Supreme Court, de Supreme Court decided to strike that law down, HB2. Why did they do it? They said in the decision, that it was because it would somehow restrict abortion, make it more difficult to access abortion because now abortionists would have to up their standards. A few people were very happy about this ruling, of course. One of them included the Republican or the Democrat nominee, Miss Hillary Clinton, Mrs. Hillary Clinton. And she actually took the time to pen an op-ed explaining her joy. And she stated, she said, this was a critical victory. As president, I'll make sure that a woman's right to make her own health decisions remains as permanent as all the other values that we hold dear. There she called it a woman's health decision. And that's what I want to unpack today. A woman's health decision. The lies that are being told in this country. When there are lies being told that are an intellectual violence, that are misleading, misrepresenting the truth, they often mask a physical violence. They often mask sometimes the most severe violences, the most severe abuses. Another person that's very happy about the Supreme Court ruling is an abortionist named Douglas Carpen in Texas. Some of you may have heard of him. He's the Texas Gosnell. Kermit Gosnell is the abortionist in Philadelphia who was actually convicted for murder, not for the children he killed in the womb, but for the horrific way he killed children. He even committed infanticide of children outside the womb. And Douglas Carpin was also accused by his own staff of doing the same exact thing, basically severing the necks of children after they were born alive in his Texas abortion facility. When the Texas law, though, went into effect in 2013, Douglas Carpin, the abortionist, didn't have visiting privileges at a hospital. So he's lost his ability to operate, and he no longer operated. But now with the Supreme Court decision, on Monday, Carpen can again operate, even without those visiting privileges, can again commit those atrocities. 
You see, there's a lot of issues, as you've heard about this morning, you've heard about yesterday, important issues. Issues about our borders, immigration, health care, our economy, national security, foreign affairs, questions of terrorism. There are so many issues, the, the tax, taxes, so many things that people care about and are passionate about. And I'm not here to say that those issues aren't important. But I'm here to say that there's a reason, I believe, that there is so much confusion, mayhem, hurt, and the reason that this, abort, this, this election is even so critical and it's because at the foundation of our country, we have an injustice. An injustice that was put into place before I was even born, and many of you in this room, 1973, by men in black robes on the Supreme Court, Roe v. Wade, somehow calling abortion a constitutional right. And what's the problem with that? Well, we know the Declaration of Independence lists out the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but that the right to life is the first human right. And without that right, all other rights are meaningless. Without that right, we can't enjoy religious liberty. We can't enjoy any of the other constitutional protections that we have. We can't enjoy all the amazing blessings and gifts that I think God intended for each of us to enjoy in our lives without that first right, which is life. So what happens in a country when the weakest members of society, when the littlest ones, when the most vulnerable when the ones that have no way to defend themselves, no way to cry out, no way to even ask for help, they're hidden in a womb, when those ones are denied their first human right, which is life, what happens? You have injustice at the very core, the bedrock of the country, and how can we thrive? How can we flourish? How can we have peace as a nation if we allow that great injustice? Confucius... <laughs> Confucius says that the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their proper name. And George Orwell, in his essay on the English language, which I highly recommend to all of you on how to think and write well, says to think clearly is a necessary step, a necessary first step toward political regeneration. So when you have self-named self-proclaimed women's health advocates calling the killing of a preborn child, an innocent human being, women's health, you have a lie that's underpinning the injustice. And that lie has hurt millions of women, millions of family, and of course taken the lives of tens of millions of children since abortion became available, even though Clinton calls it safe, legal, and rare, but prevalent all over our country and certainly unsafe for our littlest Americans. It's fascinating. In Ireland, they're fighting an amazing fight. I know there's Brexit happening and very interesting things happening in, Ireland, in, in all over Europe and especially in the UK. Ireland has had its own fight with the EU, and I would vote for Ireland to really stand up to the EU the way that, that the UK has. What Ireland has been facing is a huge abortion lobby coming from very radical pro-abortion other countries and agendas. But Ireland has remained largely abortion-free, although recently they've made some steps away from that because of all the pressure that they've undergone. But a thousand medical professionals in Ireland penned something called the Dublin Declaration. And this is the first step in unmasking the lie that somehow abortion is women's health. A thousand medical professionals in Ireland signed their name onto this proclamation. They said, as experienced practitioners and researchers in obstetrics and gynecology, we affirm that abortion, the purposeful destruction of the unborn child, is not medically necessary to save the life of a mother. We uphold that there's a fundamental difference between abortion and the necessary medical treatments that are carried out to save the life of a mother. We confirm that the prohibition of abortion does not in any way affect the availability of optimal care to pregnant women. What the Dublin Declaration is stating is directly goes to the first lie that abortion advocates say, which is beyond abortion being somehow empowering to women and somehow positive for women, but that abortion is somehow medically necessary, that abortion is some kind of a medical treatment. And a thousand, a thousand medical professionals are saying abortion, the intentional killing of that child, is never medically necessary. We can and we must love them both and care for them both. So who are the purveyors of these lies today in our country? 
It's so important to unmask the lies for our generation, for so many people that are maybe not thinking about this issue every day, maybe not realizing its, port its importance. Maybe they, they've just grown up thinking, I'm pro-choice, that must be what I am, because that's what it seems everybody else is, and that's what everybody seems to think is the, the smart thing to be. There's a group, of course, Planned Parenthood, the biggest abortion chain in this country. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen exposés of them over the years. Live Action has been investigating them for almost 10 years. Planned Parenthood is a $1.2 billion organization. They get a half of their over billion dollar budget from guess who? Courtesy of all the folks here today, courtesy of taxpayers, over $500 million a year goes to Planned Parenthood. They kill over 320,000 children every year, almost a third of the abortions in this country. There's over a million abortions. Nearly a third of them are committed by Planned Parenthood. And perhaps most severely, along with the killing, next to the killing are the lies that they tell. Their marketing and development budget is $100 million a year. Again, taxpayers are helping fund that. But $100 million, imagine that kind of money going in to try to somehow sell the idea of abortion. You've seen over the years and maybe have heard all of the other abuses that accompany that ultimate abuse of abortion. The sexual abuse and cover-up of women and young girls. My first undercover investigation I posed as a 15-year-old girl in a Los Angeles Planned Parenthood abortion facility. And I said that I had a much older boyfriend. And I asked for help. I said I was pregnant. What do I do? And the Planned Parenthood worker, without missing a beat, kind of laughed. And she said, don't worry. She said, figure out a birth date that works. She told me to lie in the paperwork, say that I was older than I really was, no one would know about the secret abortion, that would solve my problem and make it go away. We would see that scenario played out over a dozen more times, similar scenarios, the cover-up of child sexual abuse later on, even the aiding and abetting of sex trafficking, Planned Parenthood committing and promoting sex selection abortions. There's a war on baby girls, as The Economist has called, over 100 million missing girls internationally. And in the United States, there's some parts of the US where the demographic imbalance, so boys versus girls, young babies that are male versus female, there are so many more males because even in the United States population, certain groups are aborting girls because they're seen as less desirable. And Planned Parenthood, who claims, of course, to speak for women and to be pro-women, is in our investigation, we expose them negotiating and working with our investigator, you know, posing as a pregnant mother, saying how she could arrange an abortion, specifically a gender side abortion, an abortion of a baby girl. The lie has been told repeatedly, abortion as women's health and abortion as women's empowerment. Somehow we're better off as women because we have, a, have, abor because we have abortion. But we know, we know from the stories of brave women who have told their testimony after abortion, that abortion doesn't empower, abortion doesn't free, but abortion leaves a lifetime of pain afterwards. That it might seem like a quick fix at the time, but that the, when she walked into that abortion facility, she wasn't feeling powerful. She was feeling powerless. She was feeling like this is my only option and that's why she's there. You see, abortionists like Douglas Carpin in Texas, like Kermit Gosnell in Philadelphia and all over the country, they monopolize, they make money, they build off of the suffering of women in their most vulnerable moments. And yet somehow self-named feminists and even Clinton who claims to speak for women are saying that this empowers us? How dare they say that to us and turn us against our own flesh and blood? We demand better and we deserve better as women and as a society to not see our children as a threat, but to value them as a gift and treat them with the respect, give them, see the rights that they have that God gave them just like he gave each one of us. I want to show you a brief video of some of the, the voices inside the abortion industry. Amazing work has been done in the last 10 years. Recently, the Center for Medical Progress, great friends of ours have exposed Planned Parenthood selling body parts. There's so many different abuses. The list goes on because in that ultimate abuse of abortion, you're not going to find the empowerment or the uplifting of women. You're just going to find other abuses, lawlessness, law-breaking activity, illicit activity. That's why, of course, the Supreme Court decision is so against the, 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 the reality of what's happening all over our country, which is that the abortion industry, making money, of course, off of the killing of children, is committing many other crimes against the second victim, which is the woman. This video, you're going to hear 
voices, and you're going to see and hear from abortionists. They're some of the most notorious late-term abortionists in our country. The footage was taken by young women who are in their second or third trimester. These are brave women in their 20s, and they're all first-time moms. So they did this investigation. They're very courageous. They're heroes. And you're going to hear them engaging and talking with some of the nation's leading late-term abortionists. We can play the video now. At this point, does it have like all of its organs and all of that stuff? Like, is it already fully? It's not developed? fully developed. Um, okay. It doesn't even look like it doesn't even look like a baby yet. It doesn't. Technically, it has its organs. It has parts. Like we all have parts, but it's not done. So, like, does it have a face or um, like all of that stuff? Or? Yeah, kind okay. of. Yeah. I mean, as was developing into. Right, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. We don't want you to torture yourself. Really? He cannot do a termination once it's outside of the body. Okay, he has to resuscitate it and he has to send it to the hospital. Re yep, that's the law. Okay. But if, that's why a termination is done inside. If he does a termination inside and then he removes the pregnancy. So normally he just kills it inside, so that wouldn't be, well, okay. we don't use the word kill, but. Oh, yeah, <laughs> okay, or, or terminate. Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys say terminate, mm -hmm. okay, just to make it like. No, just because that's what's happening. Yeah, we, we induce a demise, an intrauterine demise. What does demise mean? Um, death. We use a combination suction. of suction and then real instruments to literally go in and grab and pull pieces out. Okay, okay. Maybe, that's, usually, that's a little more graphic than I usually describe it. Um, to insert the injection, it's going straight into the, um, into the sac and to the pregnancy, okay? It's bottom down. It'll insert through the, the baby's bottom, okay? Okay, if so it's, it's the head down, it'll be inserted through the head, the cranium. And then it's just, I mean, like any shot, you know, like a flu okay. shot or a vaccine, really. Okay. And so that, I think, helps us all to feel more comfortable with the... It's heartbreaking once you really have that encounter with the humanity of the child in the womb. I mean, reason and science shows us the amazing development of the embryo, even in the first trimester, the heart's beating at three and a half weeks. And it's just heartbreaking once you actually, we actually realize, wow, this is, this is what's happening in our country. It's happening nearly, or some say over 3,000 times a day, depending how you count the numbers, but 3,000 children are meeting this fate in our country every day, and it's done in the name of women's liberation, which we know it is the very opposite. And I think sometimes we look at an election that's coming up, and we know the Supreme Court is so important, that's why it's so important to vote in this election and down ticket as well as for the, the president. And it's so important. We look at politics and we get so passionate, and yet the Supreme Court represents and reflects the culture. Politics reflect and represent the culture. And the battle, the heart and soul battle for this country goes down to the individual's mind and heart, goes down to each person and the way that they're living their life, the, the beliefs that they have, the operational beliefs that they have. And reaching those people one person at a time is really the heart and the soul of our entire movement. Elections are crucial and they matter, but our fight really is in the trenches, in the streets of this country, day after day, to share the truth with love, to share the truth about the humanity of the child, about the dignity of the person, that nothing can violate, that nothing should, should that, that is, there's nothing more important than the dignity of the person, the protection of the person. 
It's been very powerful to see with live action the amazing impact sometimes of education. When we do mass education and when we look at people and we say, okay, anybody can change. Even though you might say you're pro-choice, you might say you believe and support abortion, you might even have an abortion in your past, you might have even have been an abortionist but that anybody can change. And sharing the truth with love with people, especially showing the victim that's the child in the womb, speaking about how it's, it's against the woman, the amazing conversions that can take place. Dr. Anthony Levitino is an example of that. We partnered with him just this last year. Dr. Levitino is a former abortionist. He committed over 1,200 abortions. And now he's a pro-life advocate. And we partnered with him to walk through each of the most prevalent abortion procedures to share four of the top abortion procedures and discuss them with us. And then we had medical animations accompany them because we thought we have to just show people what it is. It's amazing the ignorance out there. Hillary Clinton has probably never sat down and actually seen what an abortion procedure is. Everyone's talking about abortion, but no one really knows what it is. So let's show them. Let's show them with love. Let's show them with compassion, but let's show the truth because the truth is what's going to set people free. The truth is what's going to give people hope in the end. I want to share one more video that's extremely encouraging and exciting, and it's Man on the Street. We, our live action camera crew went down to Los Angeles. We went by USC. We went to the LACMA, and we interviewed people, many who said that they were pro-choice, and then we asked them to watch a four-minute video, and this is their reaction. You can play the video now. Would you consider yourself pro-life, pro-choice, or neither? Oh, Would you restrict it at any point? No. No. So all the way up until all the way up. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand, from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. With babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. It's rough. Do you think now watching this and from what you just said, it do you changes. still support what is up to birth? No. I think the person should have a choice to have an abortion or not. Wow, it's, it's brutal. Does it change your mind at all? Uh, I agree with it. Yeah. So, abortion shouldn't be legal. It's your life, so it's your choice. And if you believe that the baby, that you don't want to have the baby, then it's your choice. So, I'm pro choice, I guess. I didn't realize that, like, the baby was, you know, doing that kind of stuff at such a young, such an early state. Does this change your mind at all about abortion? Yeah. <laughs> I believe that's like murder right there, what I saw. My opinion is that uh, it should be part of the woman's right to choose whether or not to abort her baby. One word, your thoughts on what you just saw. Inhumane or heinous, yeah. It does change my mind. Like a lot of people just say, oh, like abortion's okay, um, or it should be okay, but then I feel like a lot of us don't really, we're not really aware of what's the process of it and what's actually happening. And just the uh, <laughs> encouraging, right? <laughs> We did a survey, and of 500 pro-choice women we polled through SurveyMonkey, an independent group, a third of them, nearly a third, said that after viewing the video, they now viewed abortion negatively. It's amazing that people do change when they're given the facts, when they're given the truth. And that's my hope in all of this, in this election that we're facing, this, this crucial time. But that's my hope, that if we can get it right, and I believe that we can, because written in the human heart is respect for life, is love for life. And if we can get it right about abortion, if we can get it right about the first human right, then we can rebuild the society. Then we can rebuild the family. Then we can get it right about marriage. Then we can get it right about religious liberty. But we have to get it right about life. We have to get it right about protecting our littlest brothers and sisters, about protecting the weakest. And with love and compassion, we can do this. I want to close with a quote from a hero, Martin Luther King Jr., who, of course, taught the world 
through his nonviolent resistance to the lies being told about the humanity of people of his race and their new lies being told about the humanity of the preborn. But he said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. Thank you so much. God bless you all.